let me uh let me just see I'm trying to get my okay here we go uh, this is my workstation this is the valley laboratory we are a small substation and research farm um, our main station is in New Haven and we are up in Windsor quite near the airport the valley lab is actually quite significant because this is also the place where Mark McClure who was the uh, scientist who actually did all the original work on the Adelgid, um, did extensive research on its biology, life cycle, and impact on eastern hemlock when the Adelgid was not even on the radar as being a serious pest. And this was Mark's home for many years before he retired in 2003. And I'd just like to thank him, too, for this opportunity because he hired me back in 1994 to start with the uh, biological control research. Now, I, this might be old uh, news from many of you, but not knowing what my audience is, I just thought I'd just uh, re-emphasize why we care so much about eastern hemlock, uh, Suga canadensis. It is an old, um, mature, successional species. It is the keystone species for many important ecological systems, whether terrestrial or aquatic. And hemlocks are just a beautiful tree. We have extensive areas of hemlock in Connecticut, even though we're such a small state. We're only, um, um, uh, we're probably a fraction of the size of New York State, but we have 9% of our area is covered with hemlock. We have a lot of forests for such a small state. And 8% um, of our, all our trees are hemlock. So hemlocks are a very important part of our state. It is also an important species in the nursery industry, having many, many cultivars, over 270 cultivars which are popular in, um, in uh, landscaping. And as everyone might know, it is sometimes called the redwood of the east because it can live for such a long time, um, several hundred years and attain great height. And uh, studies have shown that in the northeast here, we have several bird and mammal species that are really strongly associated with the hemlock forest ecosystem and would be uh, dramatically impacted if we lost a lot of these forests or saw them go into decline. So just to show you the um, history of HWA, um, these maps and some of those maps I modified slightly are from the USDA Forest Service HWA website. You can see the link below. Um, HWA was actually first detected or discovered in Richmond, Virginia in a private arboretum in 1951. And it took a long while before it actually came on our radar. And Mark McClure is actually one of the first people who noticed this insect and because of his close association uh, traveling to Japan, decided to do a whole time study on it. So in 1985, it, it first was detected in, um, in Connecticut and Southern Connecticut, so it's like 30 years later. But you can see in 1997, it had an extensive range, probably about a third of the range of eastern hemlock in green. And here's the latest map now on the right. This is um, the map that's available on the website of the Forest Service. And you can see how alarmingly uh, widespread the adelgid is, in spite of all the efforts that have been made, both chemical, biological, silvicultural. You can see the adelgid is continuing to spread. And um, it is now in at least three or four counties in Maine, southern New Hampshire. It's spreading through your state in New York. It is, it is astounding to me how it spread through Pennsylvania and, of course, down into the southern Appalachian. So just a little background for those of you who have not seen the hemlock woolly adelgid up close and personal. It is a tiny insect covered by a lot of woolly, white, uh, waxy material. If you uncover the waxy material, it's actually a small aphid-like insect. It's rather fascinating. It's supposed to be an ancient insect that is closely related to aphids. But unlike aphids, they are not really mobile. The adelgid is very interesting. It is uh, only mobile during its first instar stage when it hatches out. Uh, thenceforth, it is, remains attached to the stem for the rest of its adult life. And by the way, all adelgids are female. Uh, they reproduce parthenogenically, so they do not need males to mate. Here are the here's the life cycle of the adelgid in the eastern North America. It's two generations. The longer generation is the winter generation called the systems, and that 
is the unique generation that actually feeds and develops all through the winter temperatures. On milder days, feeding will resume, and it accelerates in early spring, and you get the combination of eight. <laughs> And then you get a second shorter generation, which is what we're experiencing right now, called the progredience generation, a much shorter generation. And so you have two damaging generations which are impacting the hemlock. Up close and personal again, here are the adelgids up close under the microscope. We are currently going into the, I hope you can see my cursor, into the dormant stage. Most of the progredients have developed egg masses now, and when they hatch, the crawlers, which are these little red creatures here, will settle at the base of each needle, and they will not produce wool. They will then go dormant for the summer because they do not like the heat. And then in the fall, when the temperatures cool down, the, the delgate will start feeding again, and you will start seeing evidence of the wool. And this is how we can detect infestations in the wild. Uh, it's most prominent in the winter. So just to recap, it would be a significant and dreadful uh, thing if we lost a lot of our hemlock ecosystems because the warm, the dying trees would result in warmer stream temperatures, which would affect the um, fish species such as native brook trout, which are dependent on our hemlock ecosystem. Rare salamanders, birds, uh, black burning warblers, um, and other bird species are highly dependent on hemlocks. There would be erosion with the death of hemlocks, increased nutrient losses, and also hemlocks in our northeastern part of the, of, the, of the country are important wildlife habitat and winter cover. So you can see that this is a very serious thing. Uh, more recently, I've, I've been um, introduced to the fact that uh, water quality is reflected by stream health. And interestingly enough, the native brook trout, which is a species that we've been trying to conserve by conserving the hemlock forests that line the stream, is at threat, although that is not widely recognized as yet because the mature evergreen canopies provide the thermal regulation and maintains the cool, stable, clean waters that are necessary for the native fish. And more recently this year, I was at our only primary native trout natural management area, and unfortunately, I discovered that the trees are starting to get infested with the Belgian. So it's just another aspect of the problem. So these scenes of hemlock decline and mortality are from Connecticut. They're from the, along the Connecticut River Valley. They are from marginal um, ridge tops where the soils are thin. Um, they are along reservoirs where water levels fluctuate. And it was a serious problem back in the um, early 1990s, so I'd say the late 80s, early 1990s, we saw a lot of decline. Um, we still have standing dead wood from trees that died. Um, from drought and from adelgid impact. And so I cannot stress enough that environment, the environmental climate conditions are a very important underlying um, background to how our, our hemlocks are going to survive, whether or not we introduce um, biological control agents or other control strategies. Because hemlocks are moisture-loving trees. They're very drought sensitive. Any prolonged drought can have serious consequences and makes them more susceptible to insect attack and disease. And this also kind of helps us understand when we release biological control agents and the trees are already drought stressed, and then the trees die. It may not be the fault of the agents themselves, but because the trees are already compromised. So what happens when the adelgid infests the tree? There's a decline, immediate decline the following year in hemlock new shoot production. There's lack of new growth. Um, we start seeing thinner crowns because there's lack of new growth and twig dieback. And this actually has a density-dependent feedback on the adelgid, which dies back itself. But as soon as the tree recovers the following year, the adelgids come back. And the second whammy is actually a big one. And some trees can die in less than four years in poor quality sites. And we saw this a lot in Connecticut. We saw this actually along the coastal and lower river, uh, Connecticut River Valley. Of course, the decline seems to be influenced by the site quality, um, whether the, the, the soil is deep enough and it's moisture retentive. And then we have other stresses that compound the problem. And the two major um, problems that we've seen, um, elongate hemlock scale, ICO, is a very important and often overlooked pest. 
uh, elongate hemlock scale is also non-native. It was a introduction into, the new, into New York in the 1900s. It has uh, had significant impact on the hemlocks in Connecticut, especially in the northwest corner where they've been healthy and relatively free of adelgid for longer than the rest of the state. And then we have the hemlock borer. Now, this is actually an, a native species, but it um, takes advantage of weakened trees, builds up huge populations, and this is what happens, as you will see on the pictures on the, on the bottom. Um, the larvae riddle through all the hemlocks uh, underneath the, the bark, and then woodpeckers go for them, and this can result in mass mortality. Now, we are fortunate we have not yet seen this mass mortality. We've just seen the random tree here and there in Connecticut, the Comtobora, but this is, is a picture that's uh, devastating down in southern Appalachians, which I've seen myself along the Blue Ridge Parkway. Stand after stand of trees, all attacked by hemlock borer, which is the final nail in the coffin. So back to the importance of drought, um, what we've seen, if I, I, I made this graph out looking at, at some NOAA data on uh, uh, cases of extreme drought in Connecticut during the time of the uh, Adelgid entry 1985 to 2006, and you can see that southern coastal Connecticut actually had several uh, drought episodes, and this could well explain why our trees died so fast. Now this is, uh, everybody remembers the devastating droughts we had in 2012, and this is just a snapshot of that drought from the NOAA website. Uh, and it's alarming to see that a lot of that drought occurred down in the southern Appalachians where the hemlocks are dying off now. So that's perhaps a case of uh, the environment overcoming the trees. Uh, we are lucky we've had so much rain recently. This should be a very big um, help to our hemlocks. But once again, you know, with the climate change and with droughts becoming more frequent and unpredictable, this is just something we can't control. The other major abiotic factor which affects hemlock woolly adelgid is something I studied personally since the year 2000. Uh, winter mortality, because adelgids, uh, the system generation of adelgids feeds during the winter, this has a significant impact on populations, and this just this graph just shows patterns in Connecticut where we've had significant difference, uh, differences in mortality and hence survival of the delgid from winter temperatures. I'm currently working on the paper and hope to have some out pretty soon. So I'm going to move quickly on to um, hemlocks. Do we have hope for their survival? So here's the case where we uh, in Connecticut we have concentrated solely, almost exclusively, on Sasagi skinless sugi because that's the species we started with, and we've done all the releases primarily with Sasagi skin. So 1985, the first detection of, of HWA, in just five short years, all the towns in Connecticut had HWA. So in just five short years, the whole state was, was, was infested. And we did not begin our releases after permits were issued until 1995, and the graph there on the right shows how we, uh, the, the cumulative releases of our beetles, which culminated in 2001. So Sasagi skinless is a tiny lady beetle. It is a lady beetle coccinellid, which uh, was collected from southern Japanese hemlock near Osaka, and it was first imported into our station in 1994 uh, to study its potential for biologic control. It is very health, it is very host specific. It, it prefers hemlock woolly adelgid to all others, and uh, but it will feed on balsam woolly adelgid, on pine bark adelgid, which may aid in its establishment. Um, the rearing, the, the rearing technology was actually developed at our station uh, in order to to build up our populations for release, and that transfer of technology to other uh, insectaries has resulted, I think, in more than over more than two million of these beetles have been released uh, throughout the. Um, Adelgid infested range. There's another predator, but I won't I won't talk on that today. That is Hobis nigrinus, but that is the predator down there. That is not a lady beetle. So up close and personal, let's look at the beetle now. The beetle is very small. It's a tiny black lady beetle. Very difficult to see against the dark green hemlock foliage. It is cryptic and it likes to cling to the foliage. So there's the adult attacking an egg mass. 
that's its egg. They're laid singly, usually, in, in protected locations. The larva, which also feeds on, on the uh, adelgid, uh, all stages of the adelgid are fed on by both adult and larvae. So they do not just specialize on eggs. They just eat whatever is there. Whatever stage of the adelgid is there, it will eat. So here's the, to overlay the life cycle of the predator on top of that of the adelgid. You can see how closely synchronized they are. The only time when they don't really do a lot of damage to the adelgid is during the winter. But as soon as early spring comes out, the adults come out from hibernation, they're active, and when temperatures reach 15 or 16 degrees Celsius, that's when they will start laying eggs. Eggs, excuse me. And, and actually, they're so synchronized that they will actually have two generations. Here's the second generation on the progridians generation of the adelgid. So they're the only predator to date that can actually produce two generations to attack the two generations of the adelgid. And furthermore, when most predators, which uh, cannot exist without the um, eggs and go on the ground or whatever, this species will remain on the hemlock trees and continue to feed. The adults actually survive the summer by feeding on those dormant first instanians without wool, and they will resume feeding again when the delgid starts developing and, and uh, subsequently, if, if it was mild enough, would probably lay eggs. Hmm. So just to recap, a very, we felt it had a very strong potential for biological control. It has a lifetime fecundity that matches that of the delgid, 250 to 50, 500 eggs per female. It does not enter diapause, and it's, it's because of these characteristics that it is, is amenable to, to um, mass rearing. So this is just a tribute to the team from the 90s, um, Beth Beebe, Mary Kirkpatrick Frost, Stephen Lamoureux, and Robert Ballinger, who's not pictured here. This is the team that reared all those beetles, 176,000 beetles that we released throughout Connecticut, and I'm here to report on the results of that. So here's our, our state of Connecticut. The red dots um, show where the beetles were released, and um, we released at 26 sites throughout Connecticut, mostly on state land, but we also did it on a few private research forests and a couple of town parks as well. Now, I just want to emphasize that Connecticut has never done any wide-scale chemical control of, of the adelgid. There is no chemical control program as is, occurs in other states. Well, there's been no mass emitter corporate, no mass uh, horticultural oil. Um, even uh, uh, management of adelgid. So this, all this is primarily due to environmental conditions and to biocontrol releases. One of the challenges we have faced in our biological control programs is because a lot of the success or perceived success of biological control introductions rests on whether you can recover the predator. Obviously, we need to recover the predator in order to, to um, say that a uh, predator is established. Now, we did have a big team back in those years, 1995 to 2001, and we, we went out, and this is the standard method that's used. You use a beating sheet, you tap the lower limbs, and you look for the beetle. Now, you can just see in perspective how large and tall those trees are. Many of our forests don't have um, accessible foliage, so I feel that this is a very inadequate way of, of judging a biological control establishment. It can only tell you one thing, that it's not on the lower branches at the time that you sample. And concurrently, when we did bucket truck sampling, we found the beetle and stages, uh, larval stages, high up in the tree canopy. So once again, I don't think that this is a valid way of judging the success of bar control. How did the beetles uh, survive um, the severe winters? Now, severe winters occurred in succession in 2003 and 2004. It actually knocked back adelgid populations dramatically, over 90%. And um, we were worried that the predators themselves, not having had long to adapt to our New England winters, could uh, survive. And fortuitously, when we were randomly looking at some foliage in the northern site, that little red dot, uh, that little red arrow shows the beetle right there. We came across one beetle, and we were very excited because this is the, it's big for us. And we've done some other studies in conjunction with Maine Forest Service that shows that the beetle can actually survive minus 7 degrees Fahrenheit in protected locations. But the, 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 
the big question is how many of those beetles do survive. Maybe these are just the few that survive those severe winters, and I'll come back to that. So I, be, being limited in resources and lack of funding, decided that I wanted to maximize my time, and, um, and I looked at, uh, at monitoring hemlock health instead because I could get actual data and I could compare this annually. And so one of the criteria I used, which is a forest service, um, forest inventory analysis, uh, forest health method, is to use visual, as visual rating systems for the crown. I take a lot of different data, too, in addition to this, but this one stood out, foliage transparency. It's actually very simple. You look up into the canopy on different angles, and you're looking and measuring the the amount of light that comes through the canopy. So if the canopy is thick, you'll have a very low foliar transparency. The higher the transparency, obviously, the more sunlight in the center of the crown. So that's the basis of this. So this is what happens when you look at foliage transparency. And I, and I, and I monitor a minimum of 15 trees per site, and sometimes up to 40 um, in the old days. And, um, you come out with an average. So I'm looking at sites that are on all kinds of, of, of topogra topography. We have marginal sites. We have really good soil sites, um, riparian, upland, you name it. We have about 16 sites that have been annually monitored. And you can see that in the years after the drought in 2000 and, uh, 1999, 2002, transparency was high. It was not, the trees did not look good, and there was some death. And then, progressively after the severe winters, 2005, we had um, a much bigger improvement. So these are the same trees I'm going to and mo monitoring every year until uh, 2009, 2010, when the funding ran out. And in 2005, uh, me and my assistant, Jim Presti, from the Ag Station, were able to actually locate uh, matching, what we call matching non-release sites, which were sites that were infested with the Delgit and uh, we're about three miles away from our original release site. And we also located what we call baseline forest sites. Now, the baseline sites are high elevation, healthy hemlocks uh, in forest situations which have not ever received any uh, infestation of either the adelgid or the um, scale. And what was very interesting was that you can see in 2005, when we did the snapshot in time, we have non-release sites showing very high transparencies, decline of hemlocks. And then you have the release sites, which were much better, uh, in much better health. And just marginally better were the baseline sites. In the years that subsequently ensued, I did not have time to monitor the non-release sites, so I've kept up with just the release sites versus the baseline sites. And this has been a, a very promising uh, way of looking at hemlock health through time um, and the effects of hemlock with the adelgid biocontrol. So my last full monitoring year was 2009-2010, and this is just to show you sites around Connecticut. Um, so this is northern, southern, coastal. Um, these are what the trees looked like in 2009. And then more recently, I've embarked on the period of going to revisit all my sites. And because I can't actually take the data, I don't have the funding all the time, what I've done is I've done a pictorial study. So I just wanted you to see something that was fairly encouraging. 2002, this is Devil's Hopiat State Park. It is in southern Connecticut on the lower Connecticut River Valley area. And this is what it looked like in 2013. Similarly, Bigelow Hollow State Park, which is in northeast Connecticut, um, also showing pretty good uh, um, hemlock conditions. And I'll give you a caveat in a minute. And here's another northeastern site, Mashamarket Brook State Park, which is in northeast Connecticut. Once again, there's, there's little mortality, and the trees look pretty amazing, actually. Now, the caveat is that in all three sites, I saw a heavy resurgence of adelgid, which I have not seen for many years. The resurgence started last year, and I do believe it is a reinvasion of adelgid because prior to that, we had, from 2005 to 2011, we had very patchy, low levels of adelgid. I think that this is adelgid reinvading, perhaps from surrounding areas outside of the state, but it is uh, an alarming resurgence. And just to put it in context, the biological control for forest pests worldwide, and these are, this is adapted from 
reviews that were done, worldwide reviews that were done. And you can see that predator introductions for biological control have not really been that successful. Out of 80 that were imported and introduced, only 29 established, and only 17 were regarded as somewhat of a success. That's a 21% success rate. Not very good, I think. Anyway, here's what I think I'm learning in Connecticut. I think that it would be prudent, if at all possible, to augment, augment predator releases at release sites, especially after severe winters, which may have not only knocked back the, the prey, but will have knocked back the predator population too. And so we should augment at those sites. It doesn't have to be a huge augmentation, but we should augment so that uh, it will continue the establishment and dispersal of those predators, and so they can act on the delegates there. And the other thing that I found, because a lot of landowners call me, a lot of homeowners call me, they don't want to use chemicals or they can't use chemicals because they're near water. Um, they want to have availability of these biocontrol predators. It's been so many years, it's been nearly 20 years that we've been doing this research, and only one predator, Sasaji Skimasugi, is available commercially um, through a Pennsylvania um, establishment that's um, just came, um, that's just kind of uh, merged and produces the beetle. But so you can only, you can buy this beetle if you need to, to release on private land, but it's, uh, it's only available at one site. So just a quick recap, now I'm, now I'm running out of time. I just want to put it in perspective. So the first year, first 10 years, the Dalgit was in Connecticut, 1985, 1995. We had widespread hemlock decline in the southern coastal areas and along the river, uh, lower Connecticut River Valley. It was, a, it was a dramatic time. In the second decade, 1995 to about 2005, we, we had the first semblance of hope. We had the first introduction and establishment of the, uh, the Delgit predator lady beetle, Sasaji Skimasugi, we had, and we increased our releases and sites, multiple large releases throughout the state um, generally between 2,000 to 10,000 beetles per site is what we aimed for. We also had severe winters in between. We had uh, ample rainfall, lack of drought, and that really helped tremendous hemlock recovery statewide. Now we're into our third decade. And unfortunately, the recovery that has continued alarms me because then the healthy hemlocks are being reinvaded with the Delgit. I think the biggest challenge is that the Forest Service has had a marked decline in funding available for HWO, HWA research biocontrol implementation, and I worry that this comes at a, at a bad time when the Delgit is doing uh, resurgence. Uh, last but not least, there have been many, many pe people who have helped in our Connecticut studies, and I just list them here to thank them all, and my dog, Sky, who accompanied me in my ratings. And last but not least, all, most of this work was supported by the USDA Forest Service, Northeastern Area State and Private Forestry. And in particular, I want to thank uh, Brad Onkin, Dick Reardon, and Dennis Suda for their unbelievable support and, and, um, and funding help. Thank you so much, and I'll take any questions.